some people maybe did not know my father many, many in the early years, so I would like to say a little bit of the history about my father. My father was born in 1923 in New York to Rose and Salberg. His family moved to Detroit when he was five years old. When he was in college, he met a friend named Seymour Rivia. And as that friendship uh, uh, blossomed, he started coming to the Rivia home where he felt very welcome. At a time in America where Jews were leaving Yiddishkeit in large numbers, my father started a journey back to Yiddishkeit. In 1943, he was enlisted in the U.S. Army, and he served in the Philippines for th three years. During that entire time, he became a vegetarian to avoid eating any non-kosher meat and he began putting on tefillin every day. After the war, he returned to Detroit and he became engaged to my mother, Seymour Ribiet's lovely sister Blanche. They married in August 1946 and they moved to Chicago. My father was an optometrist and he was in optometry school there. And he graduated from optometry school with high honors. He was a math whiz, and he tutored classmates during college and optometry school years. My parents returned back to Detroit, now with baby Sharon, and he opened an optometry practice. He especially enjoyed working with children with vision problems and he decided to go back to school to earn a degree in special education. In 1953, he began teaching partially sighted children, children who are nearly blind. In later years, he advanced this degree to become qualified to teach learning disabled children, which was not so in vogue in those years. Now we, we hear much more about taking care of learning disabled children. In total, my father taught in the public school system for 43 years. And all the while maintaining a small optometry practice. He also taught afternoon school classes, Hebrew afternoon school classes, as well as classes at the yeshiva in Detroit. Now that you know a little bit about where my father came from, I'd like you to know who my father became. The Pasuk in Shir Hashirim says, El Ginas Egos Yoradati. I went down to a garden of walnuts. The Medrash explains that when other fruits fall to the ground, they fall silently, but when walnuts fall, they make a noise that is heard. So, so too, when righteous people pass away, the echo reverberates around the world. Ripsvi Hirsch from Vilna explains further, when a walnut falls, only the impact of the outside shell is heard, but the inside fruit is silent. So too, when a righteous person passes away, we don't realize the impact of what we have lost. In so many ways, my father embodied this idea, doing so much and yet making so little noise. My father was always looking for opportunities to help other people. And it, many years ago, when he was uh, uh, starting to daven at a new base medish, it was getting difficult for him to walk a further distance. He started to daven at the Magen Avram Shul. And he, he looked around and he saw 
that there were certain needs in the base medrash that he thought maybe he could improve. So he, he took upon himself certain things. One of the things was that he, he looked around and he saw that they were always running out of tissues. So he made it his avoida that tissues are going to be taken care of by Dr. Berg. And he didn't tell anybody about it. He just decided that's what's going to be. He didn't just donate the money for it. He went and he bought the tissues and then he made sure they were brought to the shul and then he made sure to distribute them, each one in the, in the proper tables. And that was his, one of his avoidas. Not only that, he looked around and he saw the swarm weren't always put away in their proper place. So he would stay late and he would, after everybody had already gone, he would be collecting the swarm and putting them back in the shelves. And as Rabbi Eisenberger said in Detroit last week, he said it wasn't just a simple thing. He said each safer had to have its exact place. There were this kind of sudurim and this kind of sudurim. They didn't just all go on the shelf. They went perfectly organized. Also, the, 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 another, another responsibility that he was looking to help with was to make sure that the shul is always properly locked at night. So he would stay late and make sure that all the doors locked. He checked all the doors, he had the code, he had the key, and he made sure that the, the base mesh was locked. In addition to that, during the week when he would come to shul, he made sure that the tzedakah boxes were emptied out. He would collect them and make sure they got to the right destination. He counted all the tzedakah out and everything was always delivered to the Yeshiva Bess Yehuda office with, with everything in If my father saw someone new to the community, in shul, he would welcome them with a smile and a kind word. But of course, this would never take place during the tefillah itself, because my father was extremely careful that talking during davening was absolutely awesome. He was Mach of Torah all the years, and his, since his retirement, he joined a daily Gemara year. My father stood during Kriya Satyra, and in recent years it became difficult for him to stand the whole time, but he refused to sit because it was very difficult for him because he had a difficult case of, of arthritis, and sitting down and standing up would be difficult for him. So instead of sitting the whole time, he decided he has to stand the whole time. And that's what he did, the Gansa davening by Yom Kippur also, he would stand the whole davening because he thought that was covered on title. I can't ever remember him saying anything derogatory about anyone. Lashon Hara was simply not part of his persona. He loved helping other people grow. He helped establish the Fatah organization in Detroit, and he personally tutored many students to help mainstream them. My father was a Sameach Bechelko, happy with his lot. Despite the fact he liked to do so much for other people, for himself, however, he was happy with a little. Sameach Bechelko. My father exemplified Yashrus, being straight as an arrow in both his actions and his speech. He was a loving and caring father, there for us at every stage of life, and he was also a very devoted and caring husband to my mother for the past 67 years. He was a true model for us to emulate in how to treat people and to go through life with menschlichkeit. Kati, I ask you for mechila, for anything I should have done differently all these years. I just want to mention one little thing that happened last week. Uh, my father had a very serious stroke and, and it didn't seem very hopeful for most of the week. And, and last Thursday, uh, he seemed to be a little bit more active. He started to open his eyes a little bit and he was moving around a little bit, which was uh, quite a surprise to anybody who had looked at any of his reports. And one of the doctors came in and greeted my father and they said, morning Dr. Berg. And my father turned to the, that doctor and he tr seemed to try to answer them. He tried to, to say something, but it, 
nothing really came out, but my sister was there and she saw that he made an effort and she, she ran to him and she said, Tati, how are you feeling today? And my father looked at her and he opened his eyes and he said, Baruch Hashem. And then he said, Baruch Hashem, five or six more times. And then my sister got so excited, she was, I was out of the hospital for a few minutes, she called me and I was with my mother and they, they put the, 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 the phone to the to near, his, near his mouth and, and he said again, Baruch Hashem. And that was the last thing we heard from my father. The essence of my father was, that's, whenever you talk to my father, that's what he said. Baruch Hashem, everything is well. Okay? That was his essence. And that was the last words that we heard from his lips. My father should be a Melis Yosher for my mother, my sisters, and brothers-in-law, our entire mishpacha, the community, and Klal Yisrael. Hila hamavas lanetzach, umacha adinoi elohim dima me'akaponim. At this point, I would like to uh, mention who the other speakers would be. I would like to, if my uncle, Uncle Odom, would speak to. My, this is my mother's brother. Would, would speak. Would, Rabbi Adam Rivet will speak, and um, uh, Ellie, uh, one of the grandchildren, my sister's son, Ellie, Ellie Brown will speak, and uh, my uh, cousin Chaim Riviat will say a few words, and Rabbi Dov Lokich, the Lord Asra of the Shul, uh, my father Don will say that <coughs> Beginning of Parshat Tzatava, Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, "Asu li, asu Aaron, Chicho, big day Kodesh, the Kavod Lucifer." honor and glory. It's interesting that the begotim had to be made the covered elisi for us. Honor and glory. However, a little bit further in the Parsha, the Torah describes one of the eight begotim of the Kohen Gadol, the Me'il. A beautiful four-cornered garment, color tchelis, blue. And on the bottom, the hem, they were to put pamon rimon, pamon rimon. Rimon, like pomegranates made from material, and bells on the bottom of this beautiful garment. The Ramban points out, Echbadim, respectable people, would not wear bells on their garments. And so the Ramban explains what was the purpose for bells on the garment? Because it is improper for someone who enter suddenly into the chambers of a king without permission. And so the bells were there that when Aaron would come to the Heicho, the bells would ring as though to notify, I'm coming. There are Herods, COVID. This is the reason why the bells were put on the ill. But I was bothered with the question. The 
Torah starts out by saying that the garments have to be the covered of the sea forest with honor and glory. And if bells were not worn by dignified, respectable people, what did the Ramban exclaim? So I was thinking, Ramban is telling us a very important <coughs> fact. If we do things with respect, which is proper, that is covered the sea for us. That is honor and glory. The fact that those bells were there for a purpose of covered, even though respectable people did not wear those bells, the garment is with covered the sea for us. And this was my brother in law. A life of the covered of the sea forest. As was explained in Shul, he davened with respect. If he was able to sit, it was with respect. If he was to stand, it was with respect. When the rabbi spoke, it's with respect. Intent listening. What the rabbi said. A covered of the sea forest. His practice, as I remember, I was a patient of his. Got my first glasses from him. If someone came into his office, he treated them so carefully. And when you walked out, you had a prescription that was the best you can get anywhere. I could testify with the covered in the sea forest. He dealt with people, with his family, with the covered with respect, as was mentioned. I was told that when he gave a handshake, he gave a grip to show my love for you, not just by giving a handshake, strong handshake. I, I love you. I respect you. You are covered in this forest. I remember when he was tutoring one of his grandchildren who was having trouble in school. Calm, with respect, easily. The grandchild until he was able to get back into school and work properly. There again, the covered in the sea forest. In Shul, as it was explained, it bothered him. The Sidurim were left, the Hamashim were left. This was not in the proper place. It bothered him. It wasn't covered for the shul. So he took it upon himself. Dr. Berg. Dr. Berg took upon himself that the shul should be respectable because it had to be the covered of the sea forest. And as was explained just last week, when he finally opened up his eyes a little bit after a stroke, and he was asked, how are you? Baruch Hashem. Could hardly speak, but the words that came out, Baruch Hashem, the covered Ulysses Forest. He lived a life of covered Ulysses Forest, and he passed away with covered Therefore, we ask him now, as you come up to Rabbeinu Shalom, you can ask Rabbeinu Shalom in the way you know how, with COVID in the, in the COVID in the forest. Ask Rabbeinu Shalom, please, 
bring the Yeshua. Klau Yisrael needs it. The world needs it. We need to give honor and respect to you, Rabbi Shalom. As with Hashem, hopefully Rabbi Shalom will listen to your prayers since it comes from the covet of the forest. And we should be zoicha to that time when the world will be for Hashem, the covet of the forest. We should be zoicha to Bila HaMovus LaNetzach HaMacha Hashem Elohim Dima Me'al Kalpani. Suppose the place to begin is with the end, which of course I mean that episode that occurred last week, where Zaidi, after the doctor's prognosis that he would most likely never speak again, and after nearly a week's silence, was able to utter his two last words and asked how he was, he responded, Baruch Hashem, and again, Baruch Hashem, and again, and again. My grandfather lived 90 years, and Mishnah Pirkei says, according to one girsa, one reading, Ben Tishim Losuach. The age of 90 is appropriate for Losuach. Rabbi Kiva Eger quotes Rabbeinu Yoyna in Shari Chuvo, who explains that Losuach is from a lashon of Yishpoich Sichai. It's a lashon of Tefillah. And he elaborates, Hainu. this means, Mishnah means, when a person reaches 90 years old, it's appropriate that his entire ASIC, all his work and energy in this world should be spent in Tefillah. Zaidi obviously showed us exactly where he was and what he was with his last two words. And it was very clear that he was Mekayim Des Mishnah at the age of 90. He was Isaac only in Tehillah Hashem, Baruch Hashem, that's all he was, that's all he ever thought. His name, Avram Leib, truly personified him. There's another mission in Ovis that says, Kol mi biyodai halalu. Whoever has the following three attributes is mitamido shel Avram Avinu. That such a person is from the Talmidim of, 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 of Avram Avinu. He's followed in his ways and he's learned from him. And those three things are Ayin Toivo, Ruach Nemucha, and Nefesh Shvalo. Ayin Toiva, the Rishayim explain, is the Mida of Histapkus, to be Sameach Bechelkai. To feel that what one has is truly enough, not only enough, but to feel Simcha for that. Zaidi certainly had no interest in luxuries, and of that I don't even need to speak. But even simple things. He didn't look to acquire. He was always mending things and nothing was ever beyond repair. <laughs> Where we would feel that it was certainly appropriate and justified to toss it and buy something new, 
or to replace it or to get more for convenience, etc. He made it work, he made do with what he had, and he considered it a privilege, he enjoyed it, he enjoyed fiddling and tinkering, and nothing was ever wasted. And he was happy like that. Too much would have, would have upset him, would have, would have uh, upset his equilibrium, he wouldn't have, wouldn't have enjoyed that. That's one, one of the explanations for Ayn Taibo. Rashi adds another point on Ayn Taibo. He explains that Ayn Taibo, he adds, She'ein lo'i kino al chaveri, one who does not have any jealousy for another. V'chaviv alav kavid chaveri mi chavidoi. And the kavid of a, of a chaver is more important to him, is more dear to him than his own kavid. Sadie was so careful about other pe people's covid. I remember he once told me, a few years ago, he said, when you stroke a baby's cheek to elicit a smile, which we see often people do, and it's very cute, the smile is really a reflex, he said. It's an involuntary re reaction. So stroking a baby's cheek for a smile is really a, a small form of manipulation. And it's not right. This is what he told me. What people don't even think about, and we, we enjoy small children so much and it's so precious when they smile. But Zadie looked around at the world, he was an observer, and he, he felt that that was inappropriate to manipulate someone, even in the smallest way, in a, a baby child, and it's so, we might call it so inconsequential, and it's, it's, it's a nothing. But he was so careful in other people's covered, even the smallest infant. And it was from an infant and up. The way he treated non-Jewish janitors in the shul, the shiva, the way he treated the male man, the way he treated the clerk in the store, everyone. So many people from everyday life knew him by name. The way he, he made people feel good. Something he never asked for himself. Rabbeinu Yoyna explains Ayin Taivo as being the Mida of, uh, of Nedivus, giving. Sadie El was so giving. It was so giving. Obviously, it's been said and repeated so many times, he gave of his time like nobody else, tutoring his grandchildren and others, preparing his grandchildren something to say for the bar mitzvah. He used to spend hours, hours, hundreds, thousands of hours in the shul over his lifetime, after everyone had left. And it was his pleasure. He would give of his time. He was fixing svarim. He was putting them back. He would spend as much time as necessary to, to, to do for other people and to make sure things were done correctly. When someone needed a loan, he was there to give. Just a couple weeks ago, the night before the stroke, my parents went to, to visit and my grandfather had set aside something that he, he was saving for my mother that she would appreciate and he couldn't find it and he decided it must be in the garage. He was 90 years old, it was at night, it was below zero Fahrenheit temperatures. And he ventured out to the garage with my mother tailing on him, objecting. Daddy, you don't have to go into the garage. You don't have to go. But he went, and he went snooping around till he found it. And he came back, and he gave it to her. And she said, Daddy, you didn't have to go all the way out there. And in his later years, he was more bent over. But that night, he stood up straight, leaning back, and looked my mother straight in the, in the eye, full in the face, and gave her a full-faced smile that, he, that was his. That's what he was. Forever giving, forever worrying about other people's covered. 
with a smile that gave him the most pleasure and the most joy. The second, listing, the second thing listed in the Mishnah following Ayin Taiva is Ruach Nemucha. The Rishonim explained that this is Anova Yisera, extra, extreme humility. And as Rabbeinu Yoyna writes, not only in front of Hashem does a person, is this, is this appropriate, but even the Fnei Bas of Adam. And that's also learned out from a book of Inu. Zaidi was a humble person, never taking credit for his accomplishments or the sacrifices he made to be the shalom, shalim that he became. And especially amongst other people, he was such an honor, oh staying out of the limelight. A few years ago, Ptah honored my grandparents. And it was very surprising to me, and I'm sure to other members of the family, that when I, when I heard that they were being honored, that they had accepted, it was very much out of their character. And the reason they did that, and this says something about Bobby, she should live and be well as well, was because they realized that it would be of benefit to Batach, and if that's what they had to do, as uncomfortable as it was, they were willing to do it with a smile, which was another, another act of giving because it was so uncomfortable and so, so out of the ordinary. That's who he was. He was such a humble person. His hearing was better and he didn't have to sit near the bima. He most definitely would have sat farther back in shul. Not a doubt. He didn't want to be picked out or noticed. He liked to blend in and just do his thing so he could do it best, only the way he could. The third thing listed in the Mishnah is nefesh shvalo, which, which the Bartanur explains means zihirus, being extra careful but not transget, transgressing any of errors. And as was mentioned, Zaidi was meticulously careful never to say a bad word about anyone say a bad word to anyone. You would never in your life catch him speaking, speaking during davening or Kaddish or Kriya Satayro. Until I heard the Hespedim, I, I, I didn't even realize that was something that he excelled in. I, I, didn't, it, it was, I, couldn't, I can't even imagine seeing him chatter at a time that was not appropriate. It, 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 I still can't imagine it. I'm just saying it because people have mentioned it. Never. You would never find him saying anything that would upset anyone, always with a smile, always being careful never to hurt anyone. He was so Zahir. That was what made him ever home. May Talmida Shalavrama Vinu. Zaidi's second name was Laid. For his stubborn insistence to do what needed to be done and what was right showed his gvuro, which is represented by the lion. His in incredible change to Frumkite in his early years, coming from an unobservant background and in that era, in the 30s, is perhaps one of the most unbelievable and difficult things one could imagine doing. And yet, that was Aidy, the stalwart soldier, always fighting to advance, strong, steady, and ultimately victorious. There's yet a third mission in the Sefet Avos, which says, Amar Lahem, Ibi Yochem ben Zakai said to his Talmidim, go out and see, find for me which is the proper path that one should cleave to. Rabbi Eliezer says, Ayn Toivu. One should excel in that. Rabbi Yeshua Oimer, Chavar Toiv. To be a good Chavar and to influence people. Rabbi Yeshua Oimer, Shachin Toiv. To be a good neighbor where one has a stronger influence on people. Rabbi Shimon Oimer, 
Haray as a think about the future, think about the result of your actions. And the Mishnah concludes, Amar Lahem, Rebbechim ben Zakeh said to his students, Raya ani divrei Rebbe Lazar ben Aroch, I see, I agree with Rebbe Lazar ben Aroch, the last one, Leif Toiv, Shebechal Dvar of Divrechim, because he has incorporated his mida, his approach incorporates all the rest. Rebbe Yoyna explains Leif Toiv, and I quote, Rotzeloimar, Midas Harotzein, which he says means Zehu Hasavlan. This is the patient person. Sheinoi Kitzar Ruach, he's not short fused. Misrachek Mimidas Akas, he's distanced from anger. Umeshiv Biman Irach, and he responds with a gentle, a soft answer. Af kiyasu loydvara, even when people act with him in, in a wrongful fashion, he sablehu. He carries the burden and he's patient. The ain marbefihu. There's nothing bitter in his mouth. Kihikai mamtakim, because his smile is so sweet. The kula machmadim. He was entirely endeared. That was 80. No more need be said. That was 80. Ki chikai mamtakim. A smile. So sweet. To light up anyone's day. And he lit up people's day. Day in, day out. Everyone he met. Even when he was bent over, I could see him leaning back. People saying, hello, Dr. Berg. And I could see him looking up and saying, Good afternoon, with a full smile. So sweet. Pekulei machmadim. He was a person that followed the Derech Hayosha his entire life. From the day that he set his path, followed the Derech Hayosha, that's what he was, all the time with a smile. Say, do you want to ask him, Mechilo? Not according to the proper cover that you deserved. And for not appreciating and learning from who you were. And in that sense, wasting some of your potential. And not being a proper Talmud. May be a meditation for our whole family, for Klai Yisrael. As one who followed a journey, fought the battles, Ruchni's thick of battles, please go to Hashem, tell him we've just about had enough. So hard. We need Yeshua's. Bila Mavas and that's a Hamach Hashem Ali Kim Dim of Yalfa for him. Yes. Thirteen years I've been living in here in Israel. I generally speak in Ivrit, Lashon Hakodesh. It's rather hard for me to speak in English. I've lost my command of English the past few years. Tanya Dua, everybody knows. Dvar Ma'itim Nadev, Nechlasim Nadev. Parshas Sashavua. I've been reading Truma to Tzavik Kisisa of Ayakab Kudei. Previous parishes, upcoming parishes, it would be seemingly that the parishes of Truma Tzave, Vayakab Kute, obviously have a connection with each other. In the middle, you have parishes Kisisa. Seems to be a, 
very long distance between these parashas. Shumat Tetzave, Vayachab Kudei, dealing with the Mishkan, is Kirva with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Come close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And Parsha Kisisa is the distance, the longest distance that Klai Yishol ever had from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And from Parsha Egel, all the punishments we have from then till now is all includes Chet Egel. The farthest distance Klai Yishol ever came from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What's the connection between these parshas? The obvious answer is that that's the connection. The connection between these parshas are the distance and eventually the final destination becoming close to Akalich Baruch Hu. The Gmarna Eirvin Lafbeis says that the Mishkan is also called Mikdosh and the Mikdosh is also called Mishkan. The Gemara brings Psukim to explain how we know each one is called both terms. And the question is, if so, why do, when we want to speak about the Mishkan, we refer to it as the, what's in the Midbar, we refer to it as the Mishkan, and what we refer to in Yerushalayim, Yerakoidish, the Beis Amikdash. We have to understand what's the meaning of Mishkan and what's the meaning of Mikdash. One of my Giddi Shorim, Shemar Ulster, once explained Mishkan is a lot of dwelling. Akhadish Baruch who dwells amongst us. And Mikdash is Akhadish Baruch who is Kodesh, Kedusha, Prishos, is farther away from us. So he continued to explain that in the Midbar, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us everything on a silver platter. We had no Gashmis, we were protected by Lanon HaKovic, we were fed by the Mon. We only lived with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. there was nothing else. We were, it was totally desolation. We were totally with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And when we cling into Yishalayim, Sodo Yisukromim, Houses, beautiful, Eretz, Ovaz, Cholvis, Dvash, Eretz, Yishem, Eretz, Chitus, Oiro, total Gashmis. And therefore, in the Midbar, we were told, Ruchnis, HaKadosh Baruch seemingly was more close to us. He was dwelling amongst us. The Shekhinah was together with us. And in the Yishalayim, when we were totally, seemingly got, had total Gashmis, HaKadosh Baruch was farther away from us. But it's still both. In both cases, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, there's Kedusha, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has, there's a partition between us. And also, like the Gemara says, there's both Mikdash and Mishkan involved. And the obvious question is, if so, wouldn't it seemingly be that it's, the final destination should be HaKadosh Baruch Hu should be amongst us, not far away from us. Mikdash is far, Parosh. And the answer is, That that's not what HaKadosh Baruch wants from us, that he should give it to us on a silver platter. The final destination is that we should come from far. We should utilize the Gashmis. Not that HaKadosh Baruch wants to be close to us, but Hashem wants us to utilize the Gashmis and bring it up towards HaKadosh Baruch That's the final destination. Like the Mesilas Yishorim says, that Tzaddik utilizes the Gashmis, and just like he's Mekadish himself, he utilizes the Gashmis to become close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he's Mekadish the entire world together with him. He brings up everybody, the worldly things, towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When we speak about Uncle Leon, He came from far away, like was mentioned. Far, far away. And little by little, he became close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. 
And not only did he become close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he brought his family closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He brought his grandchildren close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. His great-grandchildren close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And all those who surrounded him, he became close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And how did he do it? Everything bits news. Like Rashi in this week's Pasha says, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Meshach Abbeinu, come, I want to give you the second Luchos. HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him, you come yourself. When people do things with propaganda, it's called Zayin Hara. He, everything, he did everything with Sheket, with Sneos. This week in, in the Parsha of Bnei Slavchor it says that there's different orders. In Parshat Pinchas, list the Bnei Slavchor in one way, the order in one way. In Matas Masei, it's listed in a different order. And Rashi says, Melamed Shekulon Shabbos. But the one thing that stood the same, one name, that was the oldest daughter, Machla. In both Parshas, she's first. Ever since Zaydi Ribia was Nifter, Uncle Leon was the senior of the family. And he was a role model for everybody. Hakobut Snius. He brought everybody close to Akadish Bohu. And those roots of Snius, Abai said, I'm so many spoiled from his children. The way he did everything with Snius, his children do everything with Snius. Halavai in the Shois of Reichim would dress Tsanua like his children are Tsanua. With such sneos coming from such a far journey and becoming close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he should be a maid Yosher for Sharon, for his wife, number one, Auntie Blanche, Sharon, and her husband, Sheldon, and his wife, Toby, and her husband, and Janet, and her husband, we should be zeichet to be as good as Tzedek Bimhei v'Aminu Mocha Hashem as Tima me'al kol b'chonim v'nei ma'amim. I guess the Hashgach has thought to it that I wouldn't be by the Levaya itself. And I would have a schus of accompanying Dr. Berg on his last steps. I do even love him. The Muckham from Weir Hill rise for Kiyas and Mason. <coughs> in the Pasuk as pre eights Hadar. The Gemara has a number of Psukim and ways it learns out. Why is those three words, pre, a fruit, eats of a tree, Hadar, that's beautiful. Why is that translated as the Esser fruit? So one of the Pshat the Gemara brings is, the word indicates phrase indicates pre eats hadar is a fruit hador mishana lishana. 
that survives from year to year. And what the Gemara means is that most fruits, when they become ripe and they grow on their tree, they grow together. A tree has kind of the same age fruits as it blossoms and bears fruit for that season. The Esser tree is unique because in an Esser tree, on any given year, you have young fruits that are beginning to blossom, as well as older fruits from years past that are just becoming ripe and ready for harvest. So on a Esser tree, there's the youngest, there's the middle aged, and there's the elder fruits. And that, says the Gemara, is unique about that fruit, the Esser. So we know that the phrase pre eats Hadar refers to the Esra. I always thought in learning that Gemara that it also relates to the word tradition, the traditional understanding of the word Hadar, which is beauty. Yipnei seva tokum the Hadarta, Hadar, Hadarta penei zakein. You see, the Torah is telling us that's something beautiful. When you have under one roof, in one base Aknesis, Mispaul, that comprise of the smallest children, just barely of age, to come to show. And of course, the vast majority of middle aged fathers and mothers that come and dive in together. But it also has that element of and you have such elderly hush of people that dive in together with you and make up the man, that's a thing of beauty. That's a basic essence that has a schus to be able to enjoy multiple generations and multiple visions and multiple lives and multiple experiences that when we all come together, make up for that sibor, make up that minion, make up that kihila. And I always thought that we have that schus because he, was that representative for us, who was the elder statesman, the elder life of that show. He was it, he was it, he was the only one. That was his position in our show. And as was said previously, when, if we would have honored him for that position, he would have been hiding behind the benches and the bookcases and would not take any of it. And that's why. In our last congregation of Ms. Bowen on Shabbos Hagarov this past year, it would be beyond our minds to think that we would tell him in advance that we want to honor him because he would have not come in and eaten the Shabbos Hagarov meals with us. But we thought we would still underscore his special relationship in our Kihila. And we surprised him which we thought was an appropriate gift for him. A special Haggadah, a rare Haggadah, like he was a rare person. It's called the A Haggadah. The A being the symbol of the Third Army. And this Haggadah was published by the Third Army after various survivors of the camps that they liberated put their thoughts together about liberation and chayrus and freedom with various texts and prose and poetry and art, and made a Haggadah out of that. And that was put together by the Third Army and distributed to the refugees and survivors after the war, for the first Pesach after the liberation. That was a unique and a rare and appropriate gift, unexpected, that we thought we would honor him for his place in the Kihila. And that's why it's Thankful that we don't have to ask someone permission to give a person an aliyah, a particular aliyah for, at a particular time. And his aliyah was either a shlishi, that was so-called the Rabbanim aliyah, he was given shlishi when he got an aliyah. Or, at the end of the Chumash, chazak, chazak, and chazek. Those two aliyahs were his aliyahs. Again, fortunately, we didn't have to ask permission for him to give them. We call him up, unexpected, or if he would have been asked. 
Und wie vorsichtig ich wurde, gar nicht. Ich wurde auch take it out. It's very interesting in our tradition that the successor to Moshe Rabbeinu, the leader of Klav Yisrael, was not, as the Medrash tells us, the most brilliant, the most learned, the biggest London, the best teacher of Klav Yisrael. Who was it? Is Yoshua bin Nun. Now what were the qualities of Yoshua bin Nun that made him stand out and be a roi to take on the position of the leader of Klav Yisrael? Who remembers what his unique position was? His unique position was, it was he who after the shear was given in the base Medrash by Moshe and Aaron and the Ziknei B'nei Yisrael, it was Yoshua that looked around and saw that the Gemars, that the manuscripts, that the benches were out of place, they didn't put it back. And it was Yoshua that straightened out those benches, that collected the Sidur, that provided the wherewithal so moments of time would not be lost by people looking for Sidurim or that Sidurim would not be damaged being outside of their place. That was the quality that the Rebbe Shalom sought when he told Moshe, take Yehoshua Benun as your successor. He knows, he's learned enough, but that quality of caring for the little things, for the time of Klan Yisrael, and as was said, for the coven, and the deference of learning in Siddur and Sforim and Staka. That's the quality of leadership that the Rebbe Shalom wanted. It's so interesting that the Chassam Sofer tells us that his name, Yehoshua bin Nun, although Yehoshua was his name, and of course you know that he got his Yud from Moshe because Moshe wanted to uh, give him that extra letter because he was afraid that he might be influenced by the Eitzah Samaraglan, the tidings that the Maraglan would give about Eretz Yisrael that he did not want Yoshua to be influenced by. The name Yoshua was his name. But what about the Bin Nun? He asked, why is that name written in a way that no other Ben is, is called? When we say a son, a, a person is a son of a father, what do we say? Yoshua Ben Nun. It's a son of Nun. What's Bin mean? <coughs> Chassam Sofer explains with the Gemara in Shabbos that tells us what the nature of the Aleph Bey's letters are. And each letter, the Gemara explains its shape and what's it doing next to the letter before and the letter after. And there the Gemara says, on the letter Nun, we have Nun, regular Nun, and a Nun, Sophis. And the Gemara says there are two Nuns. One is a Nun, Kafuf, a Nun that is bent, and a longer Nun is called Nun, Pashut, the Nun that is elongated that stands erect and straight. And that symbolizes a person has to have two roles. On the one hand, he has to be humble. He wants to get along with the people that are around him. He doesn't want to make waves. He wants to fit in. Nafshi for la kolti yet. That's one personality that a person should achieve. But on the other hand, if that's your only personality, then you might be led by forces that are perhaps not 100% proper, and because of your extreme contriteness and humility, might be misled and led off the wrong way. And on the one hand, Yehoshua was that way. Therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu gave him a special tefillah that he should not be influenced. But on the other hand, Yehoshua had the qualities of leadership, of chazak ba'amatz, of being the general, the leader, the teacher of all of Klal Yisrael when they entered Eretz Yisrael. On the other hand, he was the Nun Pashut. He stood erect and he accomplished and he led and he had leadership qualities and he had judgment qualities and military qualities. And those two letters, the Nun Kafuf and the Nun Pashut, was what Yehoshua was. So Chassam Sauber says his father's name was not Nun, but Yoshua was the one who understood Bina to integrate 
those two character traits that a Jew should strive for. And therefore he was called Yoshua Bin, the one who understood deeply the idea of the two letters of the Nun Kafuf and the Nun Pashuf. And the way we remember Dr. Berg, he was a harmony of the Nun Kafuf and the Nun Pashuf. Humble, Tznua, Nafshika, Forla, Kontiya. He would pray that nobody would notice the things that he was doing for the tzibur or for the cloud. But at the same time, when he saw something that needed to be done, an organization that had to be founded, children that had to be felt, he stepped into the breach. And he was a nun pashut, someone who stood erect and said, we have to get this done, we have to work, we have to raise money, we have to teach and help. And all those aspects that he saw that was needed in Jewish life. And of course, in later years, that Nun Pashut, that erect, strong leader of his family and our Kihilo and in the community, became a little bent, bent over as a Nun Kafuf. But those of us who were intimate with him, we would sometimes put our hands around him and say, Dr. Berg, how's it going? How are you feeling? You see, the reason why he said Baruch Hashem, when his mind perhaps was not 100% functioning, is because whenever I would ask him, Dr. Brooke, how you doing? How you feeling? What would he say when his mind was strong? Baruch Hashem! He would say with an exclamation point. So you see, when you do something when you're healthy, when you're young, when you're rational, and you have your conscience, when it comes from your neshama, not just a word that comes from misofa lakutz, something that you say because that's what you're supposed to say, but when it comes e e internally, internally, from your soul, even in those last moments when somebody asks you, how are you, your soul, your mind, not in full control, naturally says, Baruch Hashem, multiple times. And so that's how we remember Dr. Berg and how we will always remember him. And we'll always remember this room and this cemetery, which for me is the first time that I'm here. And as we accompany Dr. Berg on his final last steps, we say, not only bound up in the bonds of eternal life, but in those of the living, that's us. That's his mishpacha, his children, and his grandchildren. To be bound up in the Tzorah bound up in our lives, in our thoughts, in our memories. And yet Hashem should have only simchas and besurus, tovos and base birth, and bezoichet et chiyas amesim, and bezoichet et chiyas amesim, and bezoichet et chiyas amesim, and bezoichet
הפך נשבור ואנחנו נמלוטנו. ואם לא יעמדו עינו אלוהינו עלינו מעשה ידינו כוננו עלינו מעשה ידינו כוננו
גדול ויסקדש עם רבו, ואור לו מאוד יברוך ירוסי וימליך מלכוסי, וחי חוינו וימי חוינו וחיי דכור דייס ישראל, בא גולו בזמן קורי ואימו אמן. יסבורך וישתבח ויספואר וישרימם וישנשאי ויישא דור ויישא לב ויישא לא ושמי דקודשו וריחו לילו מן כל ברכוסו ושירו סורתו וברכוסו ונחם בסולם מנעום בעולמו בימו אמן אשר לא מורם ומי שמאי וחיים עולה למר כל ישראל בימו אמן עושה שלום עם רימו ויעשה שלום עולה למר כל ישראל בימו אמן יושבת בסי סרליון בצלי שדי סלינו נאמר לאדינוי מרצים ומצדרו שלא עייף תחבוי גיבוי הסלחון מחנות ומצדרבוי בברוסו יוסף לא רצה נאז ונוכל כבשת 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 ונוכל
Put it down, put it down. Let's make a difference. Thank you. 
Amen, Yehei Shemei Rabam Barach Le'olam Olmei Olmeya
Ja, wir Ah, okay. 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 Okay.